A few weeks ago, H Bomber Guy dropped his three hour long expose, revealing the disturbingly rampant trend of blatant plagiarism on YouTube. As a direct result of this video, many of the creators featured have had their reputations and careers completely and irreparably destroyed. One of the biggest channels exposed, James Sutherland, had his fanbase turn on him completely, to the point where after a failed apology video, he ended up deleting his entire channel. Yet despite this, another creator featured in the video, YouTube legend Internet Historian, is still standing strong despite being just as guilty, if not even worse than the other channels mentioned. Seemingly getting away with stealing others' work totally scot-free. So what the heck happened here? How does two people being exposed for the same crime in the same viral video end up with one having a fall from grace so hard he loses everything, whilst another just carries on like nothing happens? Well, that's a question I've been struggling with myself, but after some research and diving deeper into the dark underbelly of the inner workings of YouTube drama, I found some very surprising and unfortunately kind of depressing answers. So if you haven't seen H Barmer Guy's video yet, you should. It's honestly really well put together and it's a fun watch. But it's definitely far from perfect, particularly the part that's relevant to us today. The 20 minute long section of the video Harris dedicates to exposing internet historian. H Bomber Guy goes into extensive detail and presents totally irrefutable evidence of internet historians stealing the whole ass script for his Manning Cave video. It's lifted from an article on this online magazine site written by a journalist by the name of Lucas Riley back in 2018. Harris shows multiple clips of the article's writing being lifted practically word from word by a historian, including the general pacing and even the framing device of it recounting the offense hour by hour. There's no room for doubt or being charitable here. He 100% stole this tank without asking permission, giving credit, or even mentioning the article anywhere in the video description. That being said though, Harris doesn't stop there. He also decides to rake historian over to coal for some of his older, deleted videos. Harris goes on to claim he did this not because he's no longer happy with the quality of them, but because of Troll's remorse. Which I think is more than a little ironic considering Harris used to post shit like this online. You did start recording and you're waiting for me to say kill all niggas in the call stream. He particularly points out the Dashcon video and he claims it's filled with offensive jokes. And I mean, sorry, but it just isn't. What few slightly edgy jokes there are are incredibly tame. You really have to be going out of your way to get offended by this stuff. But he's a lot more aggressive in trying to paint inner historians' fan base as being anti Semitic because of a few cherry picked comments. Like, yeah dude, I'm sure all 4 million of his subscribers follow him because they hate Jews. They totally just don't think his videos are kind of funny and entertaining. I mean, maybe it'd be a little more convincing if you didn't go out of your way to dig for these comments with like, two likes, and claim it represents his whole fanbase. Really, this whole section just feels totally unnecessary, and only serves to muddy the waters of what should be an open and shut case of plagiarism because it ended up dominating a lot of the discussion of the video I was seeing online, with internet historian fans focusing on the gay politics stuff, more so than what the actual focus of the video was, and discussion of it should have been after, being clear plagiarism committed, and discussion to how to tackle the morality of that, and trying to prevent other artists from being stolen from in the future. On Harris's part, if I'm to be generous here, it felt like a dishonest way to preemptively set up internet historian as a bad guy, so he doesn't get as much pushback from attacking a big creator, he probably has a significant amount of audience overlap with. And if I'm to be a lot less generous, it makes his targeting of internet historian come off as less of a phallian fight for honest journalism on YouTube, and more like an actively malicious attempt at character assassination, simply because he personally doesn't like the guy. I feel like the rest of his video is really, really well researched, articulated, and fair, but this section is just kind of a black stain on the whole thing, regardless of your political leanings. But anyway, that stupid shit aside, the video dropping did have a big effect on Internet Historian. People were rightfully pretty pissed with him for plagiarizing, the drama was trending on Twitter for days, and his sub count started to drop very significantly. But then it started to go back up again. And up. And up. Yeah, suffice to say, this was nothing more than a slight scratch on Internet Historian's career. Not the stab through the heart you'd expect, or Harris was potentially aiming for. So this brings us to the main point of the video. Uh, how exactly did this happen? I feel like we've seen much bigger creators suffer much bigger consequences for doing much, much less than this. There's a lot of factors at play here, but uh, let's start off light with the most subjective one. First off, we gotta mention the dichotomy of cringe creators 
versus based creators. As funny as it sounds, I do think there's something here. To show what I mean, let's compare the treatment of internet historian with someone I think it's fair to say is a little bit cringe, Dream. I don't want to lose focus by going into too much detail here, as Dream's situation is really, really complex, but essentially through a few controversies, like his speedrunning cheating scandal, his poor handling of his obsessive and oddly destructive young fanbase, and just being generally a little bit cringy, Dream has amassed a hate following just as large and loud as his base of millions of genuine supporters. And I think it's fair to say that the general population of the internet considers the guy to just be kind of annoying. Despite him not really doing anything outright malicious, more so just being incompetent when it comes to PR and trying way too hard to stick to his forced family-friendly image. So recently when Dream had some very serious but also more than questionable grooming allegations levied against him, his dedicated group of detractors jumped at the opportunity to run with the clearly falsified evidence to try to destroy the guy's whole life. And you could see especially on Twitter, a huge group of people joined in, not to fight for justice of the supposed victim, but really it seemed more like to have fun posting memes and making fun of the cringy guy, kinda kicking him while he's down. And I mean this stuff can be funny, but when it comes to serious allegations like this, it really just makes me feel bad for the guy. It almost seems like if you get too popular and people just decide they don't like you, then you're automatically the villain in any situation, regardless of things they consider unnecessary, like evidence in Dream's favor, or the concept of innocent until proven guilty. Meanwhile, generally respected creators are often given the benefit of the doubt in these situations, provided they haven't done something completely awful. When Internet Historian got exposed, you could see a lot of his fans taking the top comments and videos and posts about the situation, doing some crazy mental gymnastics to justify what he did. So we kind of see an inverse of Dream's treatment, where they don't want to admit someone they're a big fan of might have had a major fuck up. It's easier to deflect and make it an us versus them situation, thanks to the political attack Harris awkwardly shoved into his video, or to try to excuse plagiarism with some headcanon like, oh I'm sure one of his writers did this and Internet Historian didn't know. But as far as we know, an internet historian doesn't employ any writers, and even if he did, he would have realized that this was lifted from the article with like, one google search. But obviously, that alone wouldn't be enough to vindicate internet historian. Another slightly darker factor I found while doing research for this video is that a vast majority of big drama channels you'd expect to see cover this chose to remain silent over the whole situation. The few that did either didn't mention in an historian section of Harris's video, or they were very, very charitable to them when he did. Even the daily slop channels didn't cover this, despite the virality of Harris's video. Seriously, do a YouTube search for any big drama from the past, and then look up internet historian plagiarism. You'll see for yourself, practically the only people that did cover this story are small creators with like 10k or less subscribers. The reason for this, I suspect, is that there's a sort of commentary favoritism at play here. I've heard that internet historians pretty friendly with a lot of the drama YouTubers behind the scenes. Which makes sense, you know, they probably have some audience overlap and they can relate to one another. But I think this caused these channels to not want to draw attention to the situation, because they don't want to risk being partially responsible for the downfall of one of their actual friends. I mean, you can even see some of these guys collaborating on internet historian videos, and having featuring internet historian in your title undoubtedly brings in a healthy boost to viewership as well, so it makes sense why I wouldn't want to risk burning bridges. It's just a messy situation for them all around, and I don't think commentary channels have a moral obligation to cover situations, especially if they have some potential bias from real life connections, but it's undeniable this contributed quite a bit to how quickly the storm seemed to blow over for internet historian. But I think this next point is probably the biggest reason, because internet historian employed the most powerful, secret, dark technique to defeat and cancel culture. What I'm gonna call the Turkey Tom Strat. See, usually when creators get called out for something big like this, it gains a lot of traction and we see the creator begin to panic and desperately crawl at the feet of the mob, dropping an embarrassing fake apology video and putting out tweets begging for forgiveness. Yet I think we all know that outside of situations where the accused are unequivocally in the right, it pretty much never works out. But back in 2020, a new option for creators was pioneered by the then somewhat well-known and now titan of the commentary space, Turkey Tom. You see, Tom found himself getting full-on cancelled over some poorly taught out and harmful videos in which he unknowingly falsely accused famed fat fetishist Pyrocynical of grooming an underage fan. And even after being proven wrong, he continues his barrage, uploading multiple videos doubling down on the accusations, seemingly due just to his own stubbornness and being blinded by ego. And back in the day, Tom was public enemy number one for this shit. I mean, it was serious. 
All his videos were getting dislike bombed to hell, the people were demanding an apology video, and he was bleeding subscribers fast. When suddenly, one day, at the height of the onslaught, Tom just... disappeared. And then the mob was left without a target, left to speculate for over a month. Was the pressure just too much for him, causing Tom to simply run from it and leave the internet altogether? Was he gonna come back with an apology video and ask his fans for forgiveness, hoping they would allow him the privilege to continue making YouTube drama videos? Well, no. As it turns out, he spent the time away keeping his head down, working on new videos the whole time. Presumably, he had apologized to Pyro personally without making a public spectacle, and when he returned, he didn't address anything. He simply uploaded multiple, entertaining, well-researched videos back-to-back -back almost daily and let the content speak for itself. He didn't owe these enraged, self-righteous, random people online anything, and he knew it. He also knew not to feed the trolls. His first upload still had a hefty number of dislikes and disparaging comments, but by the second and third video, when it was clear he had no intention of playing along with their perverse desire for mob justice, they just got bored and left. Then, just like with most drama, the internet forgot and moved on. So an internet historian found himself in Tom's position, I think it's clear he learned from his example and employed the same tactic. Just one day after Harris's plagiarism video dropped, the internet historian uploaded an exceedingly rare new video on his main channel. Now it is worth mentioning, the internet historian obviously didn't make this video in 24 hours, especially with his high production value and polished writing. However, I do think its timing is very convenient. It's the first part of his series of videos. Perhaps he was intending to release them all as one long video, but decided to upload it in parts to have something to distract from the controversy. Or maybe he was always intending to upload multiple videos in December to capitalize on the holiday season's higher revenue payout for creators. Regardless, it worked out well in diverting the attention of his core fanbase and filling the top YouTube recommendations when you search up Internet Historian on YouTube. An historian's response also parallels Tom, and that he didn't acknowledge the existence of Harris's video anywhere. I think it's worth remembering, while H Bomber Guy's video did really well view-wise, Internet Historian's audience is huge, and considering his silence, the lack of coverage by drama channels, I think it's more than fair to assume that a pretty sizable percentage of his fanbase was probably totally unaware he was even in any controversy. This was definitely a risky move by Internet Historian, but I think at this point, almost a month later, it's clear it paid off. At this point, people have moved on to the next big guy to get mad at, and what little screams demanding justice are left under his videos are quickly fading into distant whispers of the past. But you know, writing this script and looking into this stuff, although it's fascinating to me personally, and I hope you're finding it interesting too, it ends up being a little sad, doesn't it? I mean, a bigger question comes out from this, like, do people genuinely care about internet historian plagiarizing? Or are we just looking for the next thing to get mad about for a day or two before moving on to whatever Elon Musk did this week? What about AI stealing people's art? Or popular YouTube videos made pretty much completely by machines? And big creators stealing and re-uploading others' videos to make reactions? I think there's a broader understanding and agreement that in most cases, this stuff is morally wrong, and it's upsetting to learn about. But once a funny song cover, or some viral fake images are made, or it's a YouTuber you personally like that's stealing shit, we can overlook moral quandaries for the sake of enjoying some content we like. And I'm no better. I enjoy a little react video from the juicer now and then, even though I know it's low effort slop. And this is probably my favorite song from last year. We're waiting every night to finally roam and invite newcomers to play with us. At the end of the day, I think trying to force some kind of moral duty onto the average person is just stupid. If a creator makes a clear and provable mistake, while I don't think we should go out of our way to try to exonerate them just because we like their videos, I also don't think we should feel bad about still liking their content, or not contributing to the effort to take them down in some gay form of mob justice that seems to be becoming more and more prevalent online. I will fully acknowledge that plagiarism is bad, obviously, and I'll never watch AI-generated slop that is starting to take hold on the platform, and I might not be able to enjoy Men in Cave as much anymore, but I'm going to keep watching Internet Historian videos, because he makes funny, insightful, and above all, what I consider to be really damn entertaining content. And on YouTube, content is king.